Hello and welcome back to the Fullerton College Print 101 class. This is Professor Ben Kewitt with the final installment of our lecture on pre-press. Four videos in, could have been three if I didn't mess up, but I messed up and cut one off short. Sorry guys. Four videos in, we're finally getting to the answer of why did I start with a picture of a Eurofighter Typhoon? Oh, spoilers. That's the kind of plane that it is. In this picture, you can't tell because the air intake is covered and that's the defining feature that helps you know it's not a Dessel Raphael. Anyways, <clears throat> why do I have a picture of a pilot looking at the underside of a jet fighter? Because of pre-flighting, it's the same word for two different things and it means roughly the same thing. And the consequences are either greater or smaller depending on how you look at it. On an airplane, pre-flighting is when you walk around the plane and you inspect everything. You check fittings, you check that all the pieces move correctly because the wing has to be able to reshape itself to fly. You check your sensors, check your controls, your control surfaces, everything. Because the last thing you wanna do is find out what works in your plane at 30,000 feet at, and 1,800 miles an hour. That's not where you find out that something isn't working. You wanna find out in that nice boring space in the ground when you get your flight canceled and you don't get to go screaming at Mach 3. I guess it'd be Mach 2 in this one really screaming at Mach 2 uh, with parts malfunctioning. We do the same thing for print files. The last thing you want to do is print tens of thousands or millions of copies of something only to find out that it wasn't printing correctly. I haven't gone that far, but I've had some problems in the past when I was first getting into it and it does happen. And let me tell you that a press is never happier than when it's printing the wrong thing. It'll print flawlessly if something's wrong with the file. Oh, no problems. It'll print every sheet quickly in rapid succession and it'll just keep churning them out if they're incorrect. It's another one of those weird little superstition things. If everything's going fine, something's wrong. If you're having trouble getting it to produce, it's probably just fine. But anyways, pre-flighting is going through our print files to make sure that nothing is out of place. Not just in the, did everything get spell checked properly, but more on the questions like the font substitution we talked about. Are the fonts there? Are the images there? Is the resolution good enough? Are the colors actually showing up correctly? Is anything disappearing from the print file when it goes to press? There's a whole lot of things that need to be checked before you start running it. You don't want to find out on the printing press and you really don't want the client to find out when they open up the box that you shipped them full of printed goods that are wrong. You wanna find out beforehand. With offset printing and a lot of other large, um, large scale, I don't necessarily mean large format, but large scale industrial printing application type things, you're looking at a significant amount of time, effort and money to set a print job up to run. Pre-flight makes sure that's not wasted time, energy and money. I've also included just for the fun of it, a little bit of a video from my favorite film, Star Wars, which shows up twice in this lecture because one of the greatest things about it to me is they actually have a pre-flight sequence in the movie. They don't just hop in their spaceships and go flying to blow the Death Star. Oh no, there's ground crew fueling the X-Wings. There's guys putting droids into the fighters. In fact, the conversation that the Rebel te hangar technician has with Luke as he's putting R2 in the back of the X-Wing as seen in the other video here. Yeah. If not, go look up the uh, Death Star Assault launch sequence. It's on YouTube. You guys can find it. If you're in my class and you're seeing this, it's also on the Canvas page. He says, hey, your droid looks a little banged up. Would you like a new one? And Luke says, no thanks, blah, 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 we're friends. I, I'm paraphrasing here. But anyways, that is actually exactly a perfect model of the type of conversations you should be having with clients as pre-press. When you go through their file and you find problems, you say, hey, there's an issue with your picture, it's low resolution. Do you wanna replace or fix that or should we just print it as is? And I say print as is because as I may have mentioned before, I had some summer camps that used to work as a client for one of my old jobs and they would include some really bad pictures. Sorry, bad is the wrong word. Uh, that sounds inappropriate. I don't mean inappropriate. When I say bad, I mean low quality, awfully taken, badly lit, badly focused, grainy cell phone photos of kids playing at their summer camp. But it mattered to them to include those because those were real pictures taken by real parents of real kids at their actual camp. Not stock photos of some perfect looking, immaculately dressed family in Sweden, at a different fake summer camp, but actually their camp with their kids and their counselors. And having that at home community feel is what really sold the camp to, to their clients. So they would say, no, include it. It's okay if it's a little blurry. It's more important that we use the real pictures. There's a time and a place for everything. 
I learned on that one that that's when you bend the resolution rules because sometimes it's better to have the human touch even if it doesn't look as good. Anyways, that's the intro to pre-flighting. Both from the airplane picture here and from the Star Wars video, we have our examples and it is actually a huge part of the job of someone whose job is pre-press. As someone who was pre-press for a decade, let me tell you that yes, I spent the majority of my days going through files that clients submitted and looking for errors. Another thing that's big in pre-press is the idea of the proof. The proof is a preliminary representation of the final printed piece. A proof is something you show a client so that they can say, yes, this is good, I approve of it, go ahead and print it. Interestingly, the word proof goes back to the late Middle Ages uh, for blacksmiths and armorers. Proof was proving, actually proving still the word of it, proving the goodness of an armor by shooting it with a pistol. If the bullet left a dent, but didn't go through, the armor was good. That's why if you go to a bunch of museums and look at Renaissance era knight's armor, you always find a little bullet sized dent on the breastplate. That was the proof. That was the armor showing that their armor is good enough to survive light gunfire, which yes, even in the late middle ages already existed, despite what you might think about your histories. Anyways, for us a proof is a printout sometimes, and sometimes a file on a computer that a client can look at and approve and say, yes, the pictures are correct. Yes, the text is correct. No, I don't want to make changes. Go ahead and print it. Or eh, actually, we need to make a change here. Either way, the proof has served its purpose. Again, kind of like with the pre-flighting, it takes time, energy, and money to set up an industrial-sized, you know, real printing equipment. An offset press, you have to set up at least four plates, and that takes some time and get them up to color and get them all set up and running and aligned and calibrated and all of that work. You don't want to do all of that to print the first sheet, show your client and then say, well, actually that doesn't look very good to me. You don't want that. So the proof gives you a chance to have them sign off. And I do literally mean sign on the sheet saying, yes, this is good. There's two types of proofs, which isn't necessarily from this class, but it's important to understand. There are con, oh, there you go content proofs and there are contract proofs. Content proofs help them see if they spelled everything right and if the picture's in the right place. Contract proofs, if you are trying to show something that accurate, sometimes it matters to clients and they're going to pay the money for the level of accuracy. Contract proofs show precisely what it's going to look like within reason of the actual printed piece. That means all the colors are going to be exactly as the press is going to do them. That means all the halftone dots will be present it's harder and more expensive to produce those. So they're not always used. Proofs can be hard or soft, meaning you can either give someone print, something printed on paper, or you can send it to them via email or a more sophisticated computer system to be viewed on the computer screen. I, Although many people in the profession solemnly swear that it's okay and possible to get an accurate color representation on a computer monitor, even remotely, I think there's too many variables and I don't trust it. It's hard to match color on a computer to a piece of paper and have it look good enough when it's on the paper. Color looks better on a computer. It's just because it's additive color and that's what your eyes are built to see. It's, uh, it's like sugar. It's like candy for your eyes instead of eating its vegetables or just looking at things in the real world. Anyways, content proofs, the ones about spelling and placement and if the pictures are correct, those are better for emailing people. Lastly, let me end this on a shameless plug. You've now endured 35 to 45 minutes, I haven't actually timed the whole thing together yet, of me yakking about pre-press. And let me tell you that that's not enough. Pre-press is a profession unto itself. You can make a good amount of money. I was able to own a home by being a pre-press technician. Anyways, pre-press is a important job that doesn't see an end to itself in the near future. Even as automation rises, the need for pre-press rises along with it because the files that people send in this is no longer the 70s and 80s where only professional art houses and design bureaus are sending in pictures to print to print shops. Now everybody can download the Adobe program or something else, worse, something else, make what they think are graphics at home and get them professionally produced. And it's our job in the industry to treat them like actual professionals and to give them good print jobs based off of whatever slop they're turning in. This is from experience. I have seen literally everything in business from 
secretaries to lawyers to architects to people who make colored bathroom tiles, all making their own designs to get printed. To private people, I've seen people's mothers, grandmothers, fathers, and uncles making personal birthday invitations for their kids or relatives' birthday parties. I've even gotten to work with a print shop once where we created a custom printout that was going to go on rice paper onto a custom birthday cake. That was a fun one, by the way. Just saying, you don't know what's going to come or who's going to produce it or how good their skill level is going to be. And as the means of production fall into the hands of more and more people, the necessity of somebody with any clue about how to make it work becomes higher and higher. Anyways, in our school, I teach a class called Print 75, which is Introduction to, or Introduction, yeah, Introduction to Electronic Prepress or Electronic Prepress 1. We'll be teaching it again this fall, partially, maybe I won't say that because this could be in the future, not just during this pandemic. In fall 2021, the class will be remote lectures, but in-person lab time. In the farther future, it'll probably be back to all in person. But anyways, it's a good class that teaches quite a few things and I recommend it. And I did say it was shameless, didn't I? Pre-press is, is the bridge between art and technology. Pre-press is that in-between in space where on one side you have the designer and on the other side you have someone running a press and you have to translate the designer's wishes into language, both literally, literally and figuratively, that a printer can understand, both the person and the machine. We are the midwives of creativity. We bring ideas from computers, help them be born into the real world. That is pre-press.